In fact, in this talk, we will specifically ask what can we compute with quantum devices. And even if this may sound a bit clumsier, it will emphasize the twist that we have primarily questions of computational power in mind. So while we are deeply rooted in theoretical physics here, we will also take some ideas of theoretical computer science seriously. And this talk will have a bit of an overview component, but um, so when we meander through the theme, but we will stay focused, putting this single one question into the center of all this. And these devices shown here, they will feature later, but let's start at the very, very beginning. Now, there can be little denying that um, computers have changed the world we live in. It could be the single invention of the last century that has changed things most dramatically. So the machine that Babbage once built in the 1820s can presumably call the first actual um, computer while still being um, mechanical. In 1936, Alan Turing, surely way ahead of his time, deeply understood what computation actually meant and invented the Turing machine or the A machine, as he called it, as a paradigmatic computer. In fact, this machine even defines what computing is in the first place. The first digital computer was built by Konrad Zuse in Berlin, in, in, in dark times, I, I should say. And we know how the history then continued, how chips became ever and faster and faster, and also at the same time smaller and smaller, but even the, the fastest supercomputers we have available to date are still operating according to the very same principles as Turing machines. They could actually be efficiently simulated by Turing machines. And supercomputing is surely a huge field, tackling problems of climate modeling, of solving combinatorical problems, of doing simulations in chemistry. In fact, every day about a million of CPU hours are spent worldwide to calculate properties of quantum materials, a pretty impressive number. That said, ultimately, the world is quantum, not classical. So the question that arises is what notions of computation and simulation emerge when using quantum systems as carriers of information, such as ions, um, superconducting qubits, ultra-cold atoms, light quanta, going away from two machines. Again, this idea is not completely new. Like Richard Feynman not only understood that it's way smarter to use quantum systems when simulating other quantum systems than classical computers, he already suggested ideas of polynomial reductions. In fact, this is, a, this is a, maybe a paper that's much often much more often cited than read. It's indeed a, a, an excellent um, read. When David Deutsch and Paul Benioff were playing around with quantum Turing machines, they were again motivated by deeply foundational considerations on computing. The splash came much later when the now famous Peter Shaw understood that there are intractable problems for classical computers, which are very much practically minded, hidden subgroup problems in technical terms, including factoring that could break all uh, modern crypto systems um, that can be run in polynomial time on a quantum computer. He did so by deeply understanding what quantum computers are particularly good at, which is period finding. So this created a huge wave of interest um, in, in our heads, I should say, theoretically for a, a, a long time. Experimental progress was harder to come by and was related to serious efforts. In the, in the mid um, zeros, the first data from a quantum byte um, was presented um, here from a trapped ion system from our friends in Innsbruck um, around the corner. And as recently as a bit more than three years ago, the protagonists of Google, IBM and Rigetti announced and presented data from 53 to 72 qubit superconducting devices. At the same time, large scale photonic architectures became available. This is for the, for the um, bottom up way of constructing quantum computers, but equally interesting is kind of the top down approach in quantum simulation in particular with 
ultra cold atoms and optical lattices, which are particularly prominent, obviously, here in Munich, where way larger system sizes are being available and um, where um, complex matter can be simulated with unprecedented precision, um, but not quite enough to do full scale universal quantum computing yet, but enough to study interacting intricate complex um, quantum many body systems from the condensed matter context, including ground state problems, quenches following time evolution or slow quenches that are reminiscent of adiabatic quantum um, computing. They have been around again um, for much um, longer. So this is all um, wonderful and, and, and truly exciting. But a question that's more pressing than ever is the question on the desk. Yes, wonderful. Quantum devices offer the potential to perform computations and simulation beyond classical capabilities. But what then is the computational power of near-term quantum devices as we have them or are expected to have available very soon? This is still too big a question for the time um, we have left today. So we will have a look at this question in three different um, readings and ramifications. While the first one is on that of quantum advantages in computation and simulation. The thing is, this is all very stimulating um, and exciting, but at some point for this to make sense and to, to, to move forward, we would want to and would have to have a positive answer to the question, can we hope noisy, realistic quantum devices to provide a computational speed up over classical computers? This is surely not the end of the story, but to move on, we would want to have a positive answer to this um, question. A picture that I like to show in this context is, is, is this one here that shows um, data from like on the equilibration and thermalization of ultra cold atoms in optical super lattices data taken by Emanuel Bloch's team here in, in, in Munich, where Uli Scholberg and myself did the theoretical support work. Um, there's a lot to say about this. I have to constrain myself not to, but for the purposes of the present talk, it might be enough to, um, to hint at the setting, one of the settings we, we looked at where the initial state of a many body system was like empty, empty side atom, empty side atom, empty side atom initially. And then the system would undergo the dynamics generated by a fully interacting bose hamilton hamiltonian monitored as a function of time. And since initially there were no odd particles at present, this picture here shows the, the numbers of odd uh, of side particles as a function of time um, showing some sort of non-equilibrium dynamics. Now this picture not only shows the results of the experiments or the quantum simulation if you want, but also not a fit, but the result of a classical re-simulation on the same setting and not just some re-simulation, but the one that was run on the fastest um, computer that the German taxpayer can afford, that's the Jülich Supercomputing Center, then one plot would take about like five weeks of runtime, which is about as much as you can do if there's a PhD student involved, at least um, uh, reasonably. And it was running the, at the time I should say, best known algorithm for that purpose um, involving um, tensor network states. And the agreement is very nice. As you can see, and this works extremely well for short times, but as time continues, there's a kind of entanglement growth in the system and there is a kind of a barrier where the entanglement is so large so, so that there is no longer a way of faithfully representing the quantum state as a um, matrix product state. So that's, that's our limit, but the experiment runs on. Why would nature care what we think we can do um, classically on our computer? And then we can ask interesting physics questions better based on the, on the quantum data from the quantum simulation where the classical simulation is kind of done to, to build trust in the very functioning of this um, simulation. In other words, short times can be efficiently simulated, long times um, not. <coughs> a stronger case of a, of a similar kind can be made in, 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 in settings where one-dimensional quantum systems can be nicely 
simulated in all um, details and, and, and glory. Whereas two-dimensional systems are out of scope classically, whereas the step from one to 2D systems in the quantum realm is a relatively small modification of the experiment in a cable Zurich type setting or in a many body localized setting where 1D is available classically, but 2D um, not. This is to say that that's sometimes underappreciated, but we should be aware of the fact that already as of today, there's interesting physically motivated problems that one can run on existing quantum simulators that the best known classical algorithms cannot keep track of running the best available algorithms we have today. Of course, one can argue, and this has been done, that this is great, it's very encouraging, it's a good step in a, in a good and meaningful direction, but at some point we would like to make sure that there could not be a better algorithm and to be safe against a lack of imagination, one would like to root the advantages in notions of computational complexity in a similar way as we would say, root um, our use of internet banking on notions of computational complexity. And this has indeed been done. Um, there is some setting, some experiments where one goes into the lab, performs measurements, and in this sense, does a sampling experiment because at the end of the day, every quantum experiment is a sampling experiment for the random outcomes that you get in measurements. <clears throat> Specifically, what one here has would be say a random circuit sampling experiment where one performs a random circuit, a random quantum circuit, and then at the end performs a measurement in the Z, in the computational set basis and gets a, um, like samples according to some distribution. Actually, to a pretty boring distribution. It's pretty close to being uniform and it's not very, um, not very interesting as a distribution. But it has like funny tails, complicated tails that are so intricate that one cannot sample from that distribution classically. Yeah? Or, or slightly more precisely said, sampling up to a constant error in the total variation distance is classically hard up to mild complexity theoretic assumptions. Well, that's a wonderful premise because that's something that can be done in, 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 in labs that's doing something that is not easily available on classical computers. In fact, this cannot only be done, but has been prominently done by the Google AI team not so long ago on their um, Sycamore chip. I was actually in Santa Barbara at the time working with these um, people on something I will mention later. And it was like hilarious to see that literally every Uber driver and every free um, shopping center newspaper would be talking about this. So that was kind of the, the talk of the town. But it's interesting that there are some paradigmatic problems where existing quantum machines are outperforming um, classical supercomputers even in a complex theoretic um, sense. How do we verify that this is doing the right thing, that this is correct? So can we verify from data alone that the computation is correct? We would like to go into the lab, take the data, stare at them and say, oh, this has gone not so well maybe, or yes, we've done the right thing, we have performed the experiment um, well. A slightly more fanciful way of saying this would be this one here, but again, that's kind of the same thing. That would be the notion of a black box um, certification with some sample complexity, um, which is just an algorithm that if one samples from precisely the right distribution, one would accept with a probability of two thirds say, and if you are at least epsilon away in the total variation distance, you would accept with a, with a smaller probability. And also life is short, you cannot take arbitrary many samples. So this should be sample efficient. So that should be a, a, a polynomial number of, of, of samples given. But that's just another way of saying you go into the lab and from data alone in a device independent fashion, if you want, you would judge whether the experiment has been right. Interestingly, this cannot be done. From polynomial many samples, random circuits cannot be verified. And that's not a limitation of computational complexity, but of sample complexity. No, this is kind of interesting. Um, there's a, the, the argument is a bit long and winding. It, it, it stands on, on the shoulders of giants on, on the violent and violent framework for distribution testing. And there's also the, the funniest norm I've encountered in my career um, encounter, um, that we encounter here. Um, feel free to, to ask me about this um, later. But this gives rise to an interesting state of affairs. So, one can do these experiments and they are outperforming classical computers, but just from data alone, one cannot verify that um, the experiment has been, been, been right. It's a bit like saying, I have like a supercar 
and you look at it and you say, oh, that looks like a BMW one. I mean, that's a great car, no, no offense, but um, then you, you drive it and in all operational aspects, it would feel like a BMW, but not like a supercar. And then you say, well, I mean, I cannot distinguish this from a car that's not a super, not that's just an ordinary car. So what is um, so super about this? Well, it just adds an interesting um, flavor and spice to the situation that there can be quantum advantages, but from data alone, one cannot verify that um, this has been um, right. So motivated by the state of affairs, we were looking or thinking of what the best or the, the simplest possible quantum advantage scheme would be motivated by Immanuel Bloch type scalable um, quantum simulation architectures. And this became a bit of a game in that we were thinking to make it simpler and simpler. And at the end, we came up with a scheme that's in, in some way even ridiculously simple, but just, um, just for yourself. So the setting is you, you have a couple of qubits arranged in a two-dimensional array. Or think of hyperfine levels. That's a matter of taste, just a, a, a two-dimensional array. <coughs> and then you prepare them in some initial state. But this initial state would not be um, a highly entangled state, a topologically ordered state, whatever. It's just a product state. No correlations, no entanglement, whatever. It's a product state of the, of, of, of the qubits. Think of a ground state of a disordered model if, 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 if you think that's a good idea. So that's the initial state. And then you look at a time evolution under a Hamiltonian, but not a complicated one, but in fact, the simplest Hamiltonian I can personally think of, which is just the basically classical nearest neighbor easing Hamiltonian. And you don't do this for a long time, but just one unit of time. So every qubit basically sees only the neighbor in the lattice. There's hardly any entanglement in the system in that, that you do for one time step. So this has not only, cannot only be done on optical lattices, but was done um, like many years ago. It was one of the first um, exciting experiments that um, have been done in Emanuel Bloch's lab on coherent control uh, coherent control collisions in, 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 optic, in, in many body systems, which is giving rise to an easing interaction of this type. And then at the end of the day, you just measure and sample out the set. So product state, one unit of time evolution under an easing Hamiltonian, and then you sample out everything at the end of the day. So that's borderline classical. I mean, if you ask like Uli Scholberg here, he would in no time compute all expectation values on, on, on tensor networks, Exactly, so clearly this can be efficiently done and everything can be computed in, in, in this way, classically efficient. However, sampling is hard. It does give rise to a quantum advantage scheme. Sampling from this scheme up to a constant error in the total variation distance is computationally hard and does show a quantum advantage. And that's weird. I mean, how, how is this possible? I mean, it's, there's no control, no quantum gates. Uh, I mean, it's borderline classical, so where, where's, where's the magic? Where is it happening? And <laughs> I don't have the time to go too much into details, but maybe, maybe hint at, at kind of the logic of the argument. So there's no control, no quantum gates, and so implemented. One pushes the, the misery to the, to the theorist, so, so, so to us. But one can show that the statistics of the measurements being done and being taken in the last row is as if one had performed a certain random quantum circuit involving random quantum gates. One doesn't do them physically, but the statistics is the same. And this circuit happens to be post BQP complete. So it's a post-selected universal quantum computer. And um, then one can show that this random circuit is also mixing in a, in, in a right sense or would be converging to a so-called approximate two design, which one can prove lower bounding um, gaps of many body Hamiltonians for which one can then get a suitable anti-concentration property. And then kind of putting everything together, one can build on Stockmeyer's machinery to show that this is not only a hard problem, but even allowing for small errors in the setting and it would still be a hard problem to sample them. There's one more thing that this scheme has that's um, an exciting property, which is it can be verified. It can be unambiguously verified from local quantum measurements. So one can go into the lab not in a device independent fashion, but take data from a quantum measurement. And if the noise levels are too high, you would say, too bad, the noise levels are too high. But if the noise levels are low enough, it would not only provide some evidence that the experiment has been functioning well, but in fact, it would really give rise to the right figure of merit that is used in the 
in the very same in this very same way in the complexity theoretic argument. So one can really take data and, and verify the experiment, and then you say, oh, what's the outcome? Well, you would know. You have to go into the lab, but one can verify the correctness, even though you cannot predict what the outcome of this scheme would be. It's kind of an interesting state of affairs, maybe even a bit um, philosophically. So this is a, 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 a scheme, like an, an abstract scheme, but it was also fun to join forces with our friends um, in, yeah, in Innsbruck and Munich, thinking of a verifiable sampling scheme with 16 trapped iron qubits as our first joint project within the Munich um, quantum valley which has the number of it's, it's proof of principle it's a small setting but as a number of our cute components in that one would measure out qubits but would um, bring them back down and, and reinsert them in a kind of qubit recycling scheme this will come out next week i hope we also think of large-scale atomic cold atomic implementations together with um Emmanuel Bloch's team within the fermi qp project um, which uh, we jointly uh, pursue one could also think of photonic implementations for scalable sampling schemes, as we have shown here um, just a couple of days ago, um, together with the Sanadu team in, in, in the state. So near-term quantum computers and simulators can outperform classical computers. That's true in, a, in, in, in the sense that quantum existing quantum simulators of a large scale can already outperform the best classical algorithms for the same task run on supercomputers, but they also, in some sense, provably outperform classical computers on possibly not very practically minded or, or like practically pragmatically interesting, but well-defined paradigmatic tasks. That's a very encouraging steps for, for further steps to, to, to come. But let's move on with our theme of what can quantum devices compute. And go to the second theme on provable advantages in learning tasks. So that's all very encouraging what we have seen. There is something, we, we can do things on quantum devices. So what is next? And there's a couple of interesting directions that follow from here, more physically motivated. It's surely exciting to kind of bridge the gap between analog quantum simulators on the one hand and large scale quantum computers on the other hand, when thinking of instance of programmable quantum simulators as we do it in say the Pasquans um, flagship project um, together. Or think of variational quantum devices where one has knobs to turn and takes data and would have a classical side computer that would kind of in a classical control process um, change the um, control knobs <coughs> in order to tackle um, problems of an um, optimization sort or in, in um, notions of quantum assisted machine learning or there's other near-term applications. So there's a lot to say, but let's pass per total, single out one application that's receiving um, particularly much attention these days, which is the idea to make use of quantum devices to enhance learning tasks, as has, it has been suggested that quantum devices may substantially assist in machine learning tasks, that this be in supervised learning, unsupervised learning or, or notions of reinforcement. Learning. And there's indeed some heuristic evidence that this might work well and that there's good performance with variational quantum circuits in tackling um, machine learning um, tasks. That's extremely motivating, but also motivated us to look at the matter and ask, that's great, but is there hope for a proven exponential separation of quantum over classical devices in well-defined um, learning tasks. Now it takes a moment of thought to realize that many tasks, in, if not most tasks in, in machine learning can be seen as distribution learning where one wants to learn a probability distribution, let this be in supervised, unsupervised or, or reinforcement learning. Think of like pictures of cats and dogs and you want to kind of learn that and, and spit out new pictures of, of, of cats and, and dogs. Specifically, what we have a look at here would be generator learning, generator distribution learning, where one has a generator given that takes random numbers fed in and spits out samples from a distribution, pictures of cats. And then one takes samples of that distribution and would like to create a, a generator that, um, 
um, is able to spit out new samples from a distribution that's very similar to the original distribution, basically spitting out, if you want, new pictures of, of, of cats. So the task is to learn a generator of a distribution. So let's be a bit more pedantic here. Um, I, I, I want you um, just to, to, to set things, things clear. A particularly clean setting to look at this would be the one of probably approximately correct learning um, of distribution classes where a distribution class is efficiently puck learnable with respect to some distance. If there's an algorithm uh, which for every um, distribution of this um, concept class and every epsilon delta given access to an oracle, meaning just samples, stuff you can really write down on paper or put on a hard drive, so really classical data, outputs in time poly in all the parameters with probability of at least one minus delta, so probably a generator of a distribution that's close by, which is approximately correct, so spitting out samples that are basically indistinguishable from the first setting. So again, you take samples, you, you, you look at it, and you, you want to spit out, have a generator that spits out um, new samples. And then the make or break question is, in this setting of generator learning of a distribution, can quantum devices help and do this better than classical algorithms? And the answer to this question is yes, they can. So indeed, that's very encouraging. It's very um, um, exciting. So there is a proven quantum generator learning advantage and quantum computers can learn more efficiently, in fact, exponentially more efficiently than classical learners. And that's not a question of sample complexity, but in fact, of computational complexity in this, in, in, in this setting. So I should say that this is um, not, I mean, this is a full quantum algorithm that requires like sophisticated um, operations. It's also not yet um, like a near-term setting as of today, but it's very encouraging that there is a case, quantum devices can learn exponentially better than classical machines on, on this well-defined um, task. <coughs> I don't have time to go much into detail, but on the, on, the, on the highest level, I can provide some hints on how this goes. So on the highest level, one has to show that it's classically hard and quantum easy. The classical part is standing on shoulders of giants, in fact, the shoulders of Kahn's and collaborators who introduced and discussed notions of pseudorandom functions, which are collections of key functions that cannot be distinguished from uniformly random functions by any polynomial time algorithm. So on the one side, you would just pick a couple of points on the domain. In the other one, you would sample uniformly the, the, from the domain and you cannot um, distinguish the, 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 the settings. And based on that, that notion, one can think of like seed randomness and append the image of that seed randomness under such a pseudorandom function. And from that, construct distributions that one cannot learn efficiently on classical machines. That's kind of the, the high level argument. The, the detailed argument is, is, is um, um, slightly more complicated, it involves kind of an entire hierarchy of, of, of steps in a, in, a, in a polynomial reduction. At the, but at the end point is a, is a one-way function, like a discrete logarithm. But one-way functions are something we know very well in quantum information. That's what Shaw has addressed and tackled using his, his algorithm and basically using a short type algorithm and can kind of reversely go back through this, through this hierarchy and work yourself upwards in this Goldreich, Goldwasser Mikali tree to like correct this hard to learn distribution classes with a quantum computer. Again, I should say, this is a, a fully fledged quantum algorithm. It's not yet um, uh, uh, so near term, but there is a quantum generator learning advantage of quantum machines over classical machines. This is very encouraging indeed. Um, we also looked at that that's kind of the high end because it's a sophisticated um, setting of, of, of complicated circuits. We also looked at the question whether one can learn the output distribution of short quantum circuits classically or even quantumly. And there's interesting settings depending on the fine print what Oracle access one allows, where even log depth um, Clifford circuits could not be learned neither quantum nor, 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 nor classically. 
So that's the, the unstructured setting, if you want. The, the, the other one is the, the highly structured setting. So the questions on the desk of how much structure is really needed after all to hope for a quantum um, advantage in practical problems and what we've seen here is extremely encouraging because there is a case, but at the same time, it kind of paves the way for an avenue ahead of systematically looking at these problems of um, looking at learning tasks where there's a strong case of a quantum advantage over um, classical algorithms. Which brings me to the last part um, of this talk on verifying quantum simulators and computers. So what we've seen is, I think, encouraging. We've seen that quantum computers can do better on certain pragmatically motivated um, simulation tasks. They can also do better on paradigmatic and maybe not so useful um, set up quantum advantage um, schemes. And they can also help in tackling learning tasks as we've seen in the, in, the, in the second part. But of course, all this makes only sense if the machines we have, the quantum simulators, the quantum computers are really doing what we think they're doing. So how can we be sure at the end of the day that quantum computers and simulators actually work as anticipated? And for this, we need to have a positive answer or a good satisfactory answer because otherwise you are just you've just found a complicated way, an expensive way of producing random numbers. Of course, we have to have lots of trust that the devices we are using are really precisely doing what they should be doing. Now in the, in the, in the, in the bottom up gate-based quantum computing world, this kind of benchmarking is commonly done using so-called randomized benchmarking to get the quality of a gate or rather a gate set. And it's a very clever idea where one prepares initial states, and then one would apply a sequence, a random sequence of certain circuits and takes measurements at the end. And then from the performance in this length of this circuit, one would be able to infer meaningful um, figures of merit of these, of these quantum gates. And the nice thing about this is like it's robust or spam robust as one says. So state preparation and measurement robust. So any part of this setting can be a bit wrong, and one can still reliably estimate the um, corresponding desired quantities out as, as any experiment is not, not quite perfect. Motivated by this, we're just taking steps towards analog randomized benchmarking setup for um, like Immanuel Bloch, Bloch setting in, in, in the lab, but let's not go there, but rather use the remaining minutes I have to think of a um, equally interesting and maybe more foundationally motivated question, which is, what, after all, is the Hamiltonian of a system? And that's not a new question. Like when Kepler was staring at the stars and looking at these funny points moving around, and it took the genius of Newton to understand the dynamical laws from, uh, for, for, for planetary motion, they basically inferred the dynamical laws from data. And that worked well, <coughs> at least with the genius of, of, of Newton. But in a kind of turbulent system or a system involving biological, biologically relevant um, systems, this is not obvious how to learn dynamic laws from data. And we've been thinking quite a bit about this in, 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 in recent years. In the quantum world, this is even more important in the context of quantum technologies, but even foundationally, there's, there's a point. In fact, I've not a single time given a lecture in quantum mechanics, talking about the Schrodinger equation, where not some students said, yeah, it's great that we know how to evolve a system in time generated by Hamiltonian, but what is the Hamiltonian? How do we know? And I would say, yeah, the Hamiltonian is kind of given, it specifies the system. And then the student would say, yeah, but where does it come from? I mean, data is all we have. How do we know what the Hamiltonian is in the first place? And then I say, yeah, good point. And we come back to this, um, this later. And um, so what one, would ultimately do is go into the lab, one has some kind of concept class of a Hamiltonian, there's some parameters to be known and some fixed Hamiltonian terms from um, our physical considerations and taking data at different times, like from time series data, where one measures suitable observables up to some error, up to some tolerance, would like to learn, identify the Hamiltonian from these kind of time series data. That's Hamiltonian learning. And there's a lot to be said about this. There's some approach that combines tensor network models with machine learning. 
I'm happy to say more about this. This will come out any time, but maybe in, as my last point, I would rather want to stress that if you really want to work with data, with stuff from the lab, where there's imperfections of initial ramps, of measurement errors, where all the specifics of an experiment comes in, where you have to be really robust to imperfections, this is even really tricky um, for very simple, even for non-interacting models in the, in the, in the presence of, of, of nodes. And you can't make this up. It took us like three years to, to, to put it out. We were very happy to, to have this out um, just some time ago, where we joined forces with our friends at Google AI, characterizing the Google Sycamore chip, where um, one takes data using single excitations and performs measurements, but where a lot of effort has to go into understanding the initial ramps and being spam robust with respect to the state preparation and the, and, and the measurement um, prescriptions, but this can be kind of, kind of tackled. <clears throat> and the, the tricky bit, and that's also why and the Google team approached us in the first place, is that if you want to learn the frequencies of this Hamiltonian, you can't just take time series data and do a Fourier transform. That's actually not accurate enough. Even the, the pixels are, are, are too bad. You have to do better. In fact, one has to use a techniques of super resolution and some techniques of, of um, suitably superimposing signals to get a good signal to nose ratio to learn the frequencies in the setting. And only then, if the frequencies are right, one can um, find the eigenspaces using manifold optimization and then also get the eigenspaces out. And doing that, one would um, be able to understand the Hamiltonian. But then, once you know that, you can also get actionable advice on how to improve the experiment to kind of close the, the, the cycle in, in, in this set. And this we have kind of developed and, and stared at data for long that uh, was um, fun and, and exciting, but also quite tedious, I should say, <coughs> where we, in the end, really could walk the entire chip, like this um, quantum advantage uh, Google Sycamore chip in, in all corners with hilarious outcomes. So there's kind of dark corners, there's good parts, where we not only could look at the to my knowledge, most um, accurate quantum simulation to date, but also identified with the most accurate uh, precision with sub megahertz um, precision. So this picture here shows like the, the parts of the Hamiltonian identified, but also the initial map, the final map, and other aspects of, of, of this prescription where one can really map out the full superconducting many body Hamiltonian using Hamiltonian learning. I could also look at a couple of like physically motivated um, aspects like the Hofstadter butterfly frequencies, the spectra of six qubit Harper Hamiltonians, where again, this can be done to um, enormous uh, um, accuracy. So this gives rise to an interesting state of affairs. One can go into the lab, take data and identify a Hamiltonian. I can extremely precisely learn a Hamiltonian. And then knowing the Hamiltonian, you can then make new predictions based on that, that information. So get a kind of bootstrap this information to an extent, which is an interesting line of, of thought. So what we've done is much tailored to, to superconducting qubits, but we are at the moment kind of thinking more in terms of cold atoms and ions to, to make these um, ideas applicable there as we expect them to be equally applicable to that um, realm. Okay, 40 minutes into the talk, that's the perfect moment to um, come to an end and look out a bit. So in this talk, we went on a journey a journey on understanding what we can do, what we can compute with near-term quantum devices of the type as we have them or are expected to have available soon. So we looked specifically at the question of what we can compute with quantum devices. And we've seen that we can solve physically interesting problems that are motivated from a statistical mechanics or condensed matter perspective on quantum devices, on large-scale analog simulators in a way that we cannot keep track of classically using the best supercomputers we have and the best known algorithms. But we can also look at problems like paradigmatic problems that are beyond classical capabilities um, where there's a kind of a strong, like rigorous argument behind this, which may not very, be very practical, but where one can make a strong case that quantum devices are already outperforming classical supercomputers on the same task. Then from there, we moved on, looking at more, um, more like a practically minded set of problems when we asked in what way quantum devices can help in learning tasks, where we found a 
provable exponential separation in some well-defined machine learning tasks. It's not the end of the story, but it's really a, a good beginning in that one can already show that there's an exponential separation of the quantum performance over the classical performance in a meaningful um, class of machine learning um, settings. And finally, <coughs> we understood that, um, that any of this makes sense only if we can very nicely benchmark and verify the Hamiltonians at hand and look at precise Hamiltonian identification and verification, which gives rise to an interesting state of affairs because once we, we know the Hamiltonian, we know the setting, we can kind of close the cycle and use this as um, actionable advice to improve our settings, calibrate our settings, know our settings better, to then again go back and learn about interesting problems, say, on quantum simulators, but then with um, increased uh, precision and um, increased uh, predictive power. That kind of closes the cycle and gives rise to an um, interesting um, state of affairs on the question of what we can compute with quantum devices. I should say that some of this um, has been done and is done actually together with, with Munich. We are sharing a number of projects um, with the Munich research landscape that we are very much um, happy about and um, glad about. And um, yes, with this, I would say it's a perfect moment to stop. And um, I would like to very much thank you for your attention. And I'm looking forward to the questions you might possibly have. Thanks for your attention.